Hello everyone, uh, my name is Monique Seymour. I am an international scientific sales executive at Rapid Nova, and I'll be going into detail about why antibody characterization standards in our industry need an overhaul. So over the past few years, Rapid Nova has successfully completed over 2,000 protein sequencing projects, and we've really accumulated expertise in proteomics more specifically in de novo protein sequencing and its ability to aid in antibody characterization. Now, we've worked with a variety of different companies, but I'm going to highlight a specific company, and I'll call it Company A. So, they developed three separate tests for a fungal pesticide called ergot. Um, external contractors created these antibodies, a few years ago and company A had been producing the antibody test kits and selling them for many years. Eventually they began running low on these valuable antibodies so they decided to sequence them and immortalize them with us. So they sent us their antibodies um, and each antibody was sent with unique lot numbers as well as names. Well when we sequenced them we found that there were all identical antibodies. We don't know what happened or when things went wrong in the production or research process, but for some period of time they had been selling three tests that were the exact same tests. They were shocked and since revised everything and were able to downsize their production, but without protein sequencing they would have never have known that this was the case. What they thought was in their sample turned out to be very different from what was actually there. In fact, many researchers are probably experiencing this right now and have no clue that what they think they're working with isn't actually reflected in their research. This is not an isolated situation. And, you know, binding assays, ELISAs, Western blots, they can't reliably highlight something like that especially if it's not something that you're looking for. Now, many of you tuning in may know how antibodies are characterized, but I'm going to provide a brief overview for those who do not. Generally, there are three main steps in antibody characterization. You have screening to identify antibody samples, ensuring that they have antigen binding specificity. You have titering to measure antibody concentration and functional assays and finally, isotyping to determine monoclonal antibody class and subclass identity. ELISAs and Western blots are often used in the screening process while general protein assays or microagglutination assay kits are used for titering. Isotyping is accomplished using commercial antibody isotyping kits. Now, one could say that these steps provide a well-rounded picture of our antibodies. But the question remains, is it enough? In 2015, a publication was completed by Michael Weller. He compiled data from a vast variety of publications and found some really scary insights linked to antibody characterization. Out of 6,000 commercial antibodies from 26 suppliers, more than 75% of these antibodies were nonspecific or did not work at all. In fact, a majority of 56% of all antibodies mentioned in these publications can't be identified after the fact. And after some years, most of these published antibodies are not even available anymore. Out of 5,000 antibodies examined by the Human Protein Atlas, greater than 50% could not be used in their anticipated application. And may I just note, that these are the applications that commercial suppliers themselves are stating. Now, I can't go ahead and say that antibody characterization is the sole culprit behind these numbers, but it most definitely has a larger impact than we would like, and it's leaving a negative mark on the biotechnology industry. This negative impact has been labeled as the reproducibility crisis, and there have been many publications discussing the undercurrent and long-term effects of research being irreproducible. To help address the reproducibility crisis, we as a community need to upgrade our antibody characterization 
and one way of accomplishing this is through de novo protein sequencing. So what is it? Well, it's technology that uses mass spectrometry paired with some fun algorithms to analyze peptide data and consequently determine the amino acid sequence. Now, how exactly does having the protein sequence help with reproducibility? Well, it provides you with a snapshot of a working antibody. It enables you to reproduce your exact antibody in your perfect research forever. With it, you're no longer at the mercy of things like unknown variability or multi-chain hybridomas. With antibody variability, separate batches of antibodies can have variations that result in different outcomes for your research. For example, if you used antibody X back in 2018, and you go in and you buy antibody X again now from the same supplier, you may notice inconsistent data from your research. Antibodies are characterized based on what they bind to, not their physical properties. So the variability observed could be for a variety of reasons. For example, genetic drift of hybridomas or hybridomas produced from a new set of animals. With de novo protein sequencing, both the supplier and the researcher better characterize their antibody and its physical properties addressing variability. With it, you can have absolute certainty of the molecule that works for your research. Another way antibody variability contributes to the reproducibility crisis in research is that monoclonal antibodies are generally thought of as monospecific, but this is not always the case. In a study done by Bradbury and AL in 2018, 185 hybridomas were analyzed, and it was found over 30% contained one or more additional productive heavy or light chain. If we take a look at this picture, we can see a variety of genes in the hybridomas and their reflected diverse alleles of the black and red chains. This diversity results in antibodies with low orbidity and monovalent binding, and many others will have completely different specificity. But why do we care? Well, this means that the larger diversity of unexpected monoclonal antibodies could very easily be leading you astray, introducing multi-site binding and inconsistent results. In fact, it was found that the most abundant mRNA transcripts found in hybridoma cell lines did not necessarily encode the antibody chains providing the correct specificity. So you don't really know what your antibody is made up of unless you sequence it and get a real-time picture of the physical antibody that you're working with. So I've mentioned some stats about why reproducibility is a problem. And I've gone into the science behind how using de novo protein sequencing can aid to better characterize antibodies, thus addressing the reproducibility crisis. But now I'm going to provide you with some information behind Rapid Nover's personal experience of the problem. What we see on the left is an SDS gel that we've actually run in our lab. In a perfect world, we see two bands portraying the heavy and the light chains of the antibody as seen in the middle column. But about 20% of the time, we get what looks like the column to the right. The blur that you're seeing is the result of contaminants, the like of proteins, multiple antibodies, uh, multiple heavy chains, multiple light chains, in what was thought to be a purified monoclonal sample. Now what you see on your right is a quick preview of your completed sequencing project portrayed on our peptide viewer after we've analyzed the samples that you see in that gel. So this protein sequencing data is all yours and available forever as a part of your antibody characterization. Now we've helped researchers address a characterization problem they didn't know they had by providing them with the protein sequences of what they sent, ensuring that they can assign the sequences to an antibody ID, as well as be absolutely confident in the molecule they're working with and not become victims of variability. I hope I've shed some light on antibody characterization and how de novo protein sequencing can be a great way to combat the reproducibility crisis together. Thank you all very much for listening. 
Um, if you have any questions, um, my contact details are on the slide. Please do not hesitate to reach out.